Hello and welcome to Kids Corner on Armstrong Channel 20. I'm Miss Krista and I'm so excited today to be at Poland Union Elementary School with Mrs. Massarelli's third grade class. Guess what's coming up soon? You can probably feel it in the air, maybe see it on the ground as the snow melts, maybe see it on the trees starting to get little buds. The first day of spring is so close. It's March 20th and guess what else is March 20th? It's World Literacy Day. And World Literacy Day celebrates the art of storytelling. So make sure on March 20th, you read a story. This year's theme is all about monsters and dragons. So we're doing a special book to commemorate World Literacy Day, Henry and the Kite Dragon. And this book is written by Bruce Edward Hall. And you can get this book at your local library. After that, we're going to make our very own kites. And the coolest thing about these kites, you can make them right at home, just out of papers and staples and a lot of imagination. I hope that you love our story and our craft. And if you would like Armstrong to come to your school, have a grown-up email us at channel20, that's channel20, at agoc.com. I think our class is ready. Let's get started. Hi. I got this book from the library yesterday, and it is called Henry and the Kite Dragon. There is one very specific reason I got this book. Okay, there's two, really, but let's start with one. Who knows why I got this book? Guess. It's Chinese, probably. I do, I, I do like it because it is um, a, a world, it's an international book. Mm -hmm. Why else do you think? It has a dragon. I do, I like dragons. That's exactly why I picked it because it has a dragon. You know why? World Literacy Day is coming up March 20th. And guess what the theme is for this year? Dragons. Monsters and dragons. So on March 20th, which is the first day of spring, it always falls on the first day of spring every year and there's a different theme every year. You are supposed to either tell someone a story about monsters or dragons or listen to a story about monsters or dragons because World Literacy Day celebrates the art of oral storytelling, which is listening to someone tell a story or telling a story to someone. Do you ever read to your like little brothers or sisters? You're, you're kind of? What about your goldfish, your dog? <laughs> Goldfish love to listen to books, they do. What about you, your goldfish? No, bird, cat? My little sister. You read to your little sister, does she love it? Does she look up to you? She doesn't really sit. Oh, little sisters don't really sit, no. I but, read the first page, page and she walks away. Oh, she, <laughs> little sisters do that, they do. But I bet, do you love reading to her? And reading out loud is different than reading a book to yourself, right? You have to kind of change your voice and, and talk differently. Yeah, what about you? Um, I like to read to my grandma's dogs and my little sister. Your grandma's dogs and your little sister. Because my grandma's dogs actually sit and listen. Do they sit and listen? That's fantastic. And your little sister doesn't? No, my, my little dog that I have at home, she's still young, so she doesn't sit and listen. Uh, just like his, like the younger they are, huh? like maybe your little sister, the younger they are, they don't like to sit, but the older ones do, huh? They like the sound of your voice, I bet. Huh? It's comforting to them. Well, then let's read this story out loud, if I may. And this is about a little boy who is Chinese, but he doesn't live in China anymore. We've all been the new kid, huh? This story is based on true events. When my father was a little boy in Chinatown in the 1920s, there was an old man named Mr. Chen who lived in his building. He made wonderful kites and let a few lucky kids help fly them. Henry's adventure is inspired by him. That's from the author, so this is a true story about his dad. My name is Henry Chu. I am eight years old. I live in a place called Chinatown in New York City. Chinatown is very small, pretty much just three tiny streets, all narrow and crooked, like in a village in China would be. Doyer Street is the littlest and crookedest street in Chinatown. It was a place to buy tasty little dumplings to have with our tea. I like the ones with shrimp. My friend Thelma Fung likes the ones with sweet roast pork. Mott Street is where my family lives. Our building is the tallest of all. From one side, you can see all the way down to Pell Street. And on the other, you can look right down into the next neighborhood. 
It's called Little Italy. You have Little Italy and Chinatown next to each other. In Chinatown, New York, there are lots of things to do for fun. You can buy sweet pickled onions from Mrs. Lee's stand for two cents each. You can watch Mr. Eng sort mail at the littlest post office in New York City. It's only eight feet wide. It's as wide as this rug that you're sitting on. But my favorite thing to do in Chinatown, more favorite than anything, is fly kites. And on the top floor of my building lives a man who makes the best kites of all, the best kites in the whole wide world. His name is Mr. Chen, but we call him grandfather. It's a sign of respect for his age. When he was a kid in China, everyone made kites, but his kites were the biggest and the prettiest, flew the highest and always won first prize in all the contests. He is little and old now and always wears a sweater with holes and worn out brown slippers. But he still likes to climb the stairs to the roof to fly one of his famous kites shaped like a butterfly or a caterpillar or his specialty, a big beautiful dragon. That looks like a bird. That one does look like a bird. Let's see if he has a dragon one coming up. My friend Thelma Fung and I get to help Grandfather Chen make them. One time we made a butterfly from broken up packing crates. The body was made from cardboard. We used the big pot of rice paste that Grandfather Chen boiled on the stove to stick on sheets of newspaper to make wings. Grandfather Chen painted on bright orange stripes and deep purple spots and glued on glittery gold foil and blue polka dots. Thelma Fung and I thought it was the best, most wonderful butterfly we'd ever seen. Up on the roof, it was a perfect kite flying day. A brisk breeze, not too cold, and sunshine broken up by clouds skipping across the sky. But Grandfather Chen was not only a great kite maker, he was a great kite flyer. Slowly, he let the butterfly rise up and out and over until it caught the wind and just took off. He made the butterfly do swoops. He made it do swirls. He made it do loop-the-loops and reverse curls. Our butterfly seemed alive. A pigeon flew by, and in a flash, Grandfather Chan made the kite chase the little bird, as if our big, beautiful butterfly were going to eat him up. The pigeon flew away as fast as his wings could carry him. Our new friend, the butterfly, sailed over the building behind us and paused over the park in Little Italy a block away. But then something happened. A kid named Tony Guglioni saw our kite. Whiz! A rock flew past our beautiful butterfly. Whizzing! Two more went by, one of them just nicking the wing. Then smash, crash, rip! A whole hail of rocks and pebbles tore through the butterfly's wings. Trembling as if in pain, the wonderful butterfly sank slowly to the ground, right into the park. Tony and his friends tore the kite to bits. They ripped it and stomped on it and shook their fists. Tony always made trouble for us Chinese kids. And that's why we never went into the park when he and his friends were there. Grandfather Chen just watched, never uttering a word. Finally, he turned to Thelma and me and said, well, we'll just have to go and make another one. The next day, we, made, we three made a caterpillar kite. It was long and sleek, painted bright yellow with red dots and had face that made it look like it was surprised to be flying in the clouds at the end of a string. The sky was overcast and there was the smell of rain in the air. Grandfather Chen made the caterpillar chase its own tail. He made it wave like the ocean. He made it squiggle and spiral. This time, two pigeons appeared and Grandfather Chen sent the giant caterpillar racing after them. They were terrified and shot away from the kite. But then it happened again. Whoosh went a rock. Zing went another. Then Tony Guglioni tied a long string to a stone and threw it right over the caterpillar string like a lasso. Now Tony and his friends reeled in our beautiful caterpillar and once again, our kite was stomped to pieces. 
Let's go beat them up, I shouted. Let's get all our friends and go down there and fight them. But Grandfather Chen just shook his head. I have a better idea. But yes, get all of your friends. Oh, good, I thought. Tony and his friends will leave us alone once and for all. Soon, all our Chinatown buddies were climbing the stairs to Grandfather Chen's apartment. Everett Singh, Francis Ng, Walter Holm, Constance Ling, and others. But when we got there, we couldn't believe our eyes. Pots of paste boiled on the stove. Old wooden crates were everywhere, and so were stacks of colorful waste paper. Come on, come on, Grandfather Chen said. We have a kite to make. Make a kite? Now? But what could we do? After all, it was Grandfather Chen, so we rolled up our sleeves. That day's kite was a dragon. It was huge, stretching from one end of the kitchen to the other and back again. Who knew how long it was? It was covered in dazzling red rice paper and had two six-foot-long streamers for a tail. They were made of gold rice paper. You think that's what's going to happen? I think it's going to... Look at it. It's has an open mouth, sharp teeth, and it looks like it's gonna eat. You're right, an open mouth and sharp teeth. It looks pretty angry, huh? And it has red eyes. And there are such things as, as fighting kites. Do you know the first kites were used at, in war? Soldiers used them to send messages. So maybe it is a soldier of sorts. At last, the dragon kite was ready. It was so long, it took all of us to carry it to the roof. This kite is so big and so beautiful that they wouldn't dare throw rocks at it, Grandfather Chen said. Everyone respects dragons. You'll see. There was another pigeon flying around, just one lonely bird all by himself. We wanted the kite to chase it, but before we could even get the dragon in the air, Tony and his friends started throwing rocks again. What do you think they should do? Should they go fight him? Yeah. That's when I got really mad. Mm. Come on, I shouted and led my friends down eight flights of stairs and out onto the street, leaving Grandfather Chen and the giant, 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 giant dragon oh, oh, kite on the roof alone. Wait, Grandfather Chen called after us. Where are you going? But we kids just kept walking right down Mott Street, making a right turn at the Catholic Church and marching one short block into the park where Tony and his friends were waiting. Chinese kids never went into the park when Tony Guglioni was there. But we did that day. At first, Tony and his friends just stood there with their mouths open. There was silence for one moment. Then Tony spoke. Ching chong Chinamen, Tony Guglioni jeered. Stop it, I yelled. Tony Goo Goo Eyes. He was stunned. Get out of our park, he finally sputtered. No, you get out. No, you. You. We were here first. We were all lined up, breathing hard, ready to start swinging, when all of a sudden, the sky went dark. A big splash of color seemed to stretch across the entire sky. It was so big, it blotted out the sun like a giant cloud. Grandfather Chen had launched the dragon by himself. For a moment, everyone in the park was quiet as the gigantic creature hung in the air above our building and then started to dance. It made a slow curve. Everyone said, oh. It made a majestic swing. Everyone said, and then that pigeon flew by. The dragon darted after the little bird as if it were going to swallow it up in one bite. Stop it! Stop it! Tony screamed, that's my pigeon! Huh? We all said. Your pigeon? What are you talking about? That's when I began to understand. In Little Italy, they kept pet pigeons homing pigeons and cages on their roofs. He told me that homing pigeons are especially trained to always come home. He told me how our kites scared the little birds and sometimes they flew away and never came back. And that pigeon's my favorite. Make that dragon leave my pigeon alone. 
Then great big Tony Guglioni actually started to cry. I didn't know what to say. Elma Fung didn't know what to say. Everett Singh, Francis Ng, and Constance Ling didn't know what to say. We all just stood there, too surprised to move. Then I got an idea. Grandfather Chen, stop! I shouted up to the rooftop. Francis Ng, Walter Hahn, and Constance Ling joined in. Then even Tony and his friends started shouting, Grandfather, Grandfather! What's his name? Grandfather Chen, stop! All at once, we started running up the hill to Mott Street. The Chinese kids, Tony Guglioni and his friends. Everybody running and shouting, Grandfather Chen, stop, stop! We ran right up to our building, dashed through the door and up the stairs, still shouting, Grandfather Chen, stop, stop! By the time we got there, we were all out of breath. Grandfather, stop, Pigeon, Pat, Tony, please, ah! Oh. Grandfather Chen just looked at me, then he looked at Tony, then he looked at my friends and Tony's friends. Finally he said, are you all crazy? When we told him about Tony's pet bird, Grandfather immediately reeled in the big, beautiful dragon. But my friends and I watched as the poor, frightened homing pigeon made a couple of big, graceful circles and flew off to a cage we could see on the roof of a building a couple of blocks away. Everyone let out a sigh of relief. And then, for the first time, Tony took a good, hard look at our dragon kite. Where'd you buy it? We laughed and told him how we made kites out of packing crates and rice paper and how Grandfather Chen painted on the faces. I guess I'm sorry we threw rocks at them. He paused. It was our pet birds we were worried about. We Chinese kids were sorry too, and we said so, one by one. Then we had another idea. From that day on, the Chinese kids fly kites in the mornings. The Italian kids fly their birds in the afternoons. The really great thing about this is, now we can admire their birds and they can admire our kites. And everybody can go to the park whenever they want. The next kite Grandfather Chin made was a brand new specialty. It was big. It was silvery. It was all shiny and shimmery. The kite he made was a giant pigeon. And now, when the kids in the park see it, all they say is, aww. Are those the coolest kites ever? Yes. Did you know that there were pets like pigeons that other people kept, like in other countries, in other cultures? Did you know that? Did you know that there's other cultures that don't name their dogs? Yep. Yeah. That, that was a story. I think, I think that was a second grade or a third grade story, huh, Mrs. Massarelli? Maybe it didn't come up yet. I forget. One of my kids brought it home in a book. Oh, sorry, fourth grade. It's a fourth grade story. But we learned, you can learn lots of things from other cultures that you never knew happened because you just assume that whatever way you do things is the way everybody does things, huh? I hope that you love this book. I hope even more so that you love our craft. Guess what we're gonna do? Not a dragon. Good guess, though. A kite. a kite. You're each going to make your own kite. Now, the cool thing about these kites is you, I made this kite in my office with the help of my friend, Rich Booth, who is an expert kite maker and airplane maker, if you want to know. And you can make it from stuff you have at home. So you can go home and make kites like this anytime you want, just like Grandfather Chen did. Are you ready? This kite will get off the air. It'll fly about seven feet up if you were outside running with it. Right now, we're gonna see if we could just fly it a little bit. And this is just a little kite, right? Because remember, just like when you're practicing things, you start out small, little by little. Let's see if we can get it to fly. Wait, wait, wait. Take two. Take two, Mr. Greg. <laughs> and then you can swing it around and it will, it'll start to loft. You've gotta get it. See? So, that is what you're going to start with. I think Miss Krista just made herself a little dizzy there. Okay. We are going to start with regular paper. 
And a kite is anything that's going to fly on a string. So we're going to start. It has kind of the shape of a bird, but it's going to be whatever you want it to be. You'll see that there is a string attached to it, and there's more string around my stick. Now, there's something important about this kite. How heavy do you think it is? It is light. It's light, light. The reason it has to be so light is so that the wind will take it away. Why do birds fly? I mean, why are, how, how light do you think a bird is? Why do birds fly, red girl? They're light. They have hollow bones. So they're very light, so the air can lift them up. And that's exactly what's going to happen with our kite. Before we do this, though, my kite is very, very boring. It doesn't look like Grandfather Chen's kites at all. You are going to need to decorate your kites. Now, since we need to keep, and there's a couple things that aren't on the table yet. I have one surprise for you. Since we need to keep our kites so light, we are only using decorations that we can write on or stamp on, because we don't want to weigh it down any, because if you weigh it down, then it's going to be harder for the air to pick it up and get some loft. We are going to use the markers that are in front of you. I have some color changing pencils for you that you can write on it. You could use the sign. You could take these home. These are for you. And then I have some white pencils here that you see are not sharpened because we're going to use the eraser top. And that's going to be your stamper. Okay, so I've got, I've got red ink and I've got blue ink and we're going to pass them out so that you can stamp them as well. That's how you're going to decorate them. We, however, are going to do one thing very specific before we start decorating because my friend Rich Booth in my office, my expert kite maker, taught me that the reason my kite in the office wasn't working is because the paper was too flat. So when I was making my kite, I folded the paper, I pulled up the edges, and he said it was too thin. See how skinny my kite is? It needs to be like that. And he said the way to do that is to curl the paper. He said, you've got to curl the paper. So when you start curling the paper, see? Just gotta... Fold opposite your curl. Fold, yes, correct. Fold the other side of your curl.
I had so much fun today at Poland Union Elementary School with Mrs. Massarelli's third grade class. We read a great book called Henry and the Kite Dragon by Bruce Edward Hall. And we read this in honor of World Literacy Day, which is the first day of spring every year. We also made our very own kites. And we made them simply out of using some big typing paper. The lighter the paper, the better. You can even use newspaper. And then the kids had a lot of fun decorating them. And then we stapled them together. We put a little hole in them. And then they're going to put the string right through. Would you like to go see Miss Shelley, please? There you go. I hope that you love today's book and today's craft. And if you would like Armstrong to come to your school, have a grown-up email us at channel20, that's channel, 20 at agoc.com. This is Miss Christopher Kids Corner. I hope you have a great kite flying day.